Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's CAST Roundtable Conversation, Safe and Positive Climate Implementation. My name is Rosie O'Brien Boytak, and I'm an Assistant Executive Director for the Connecticut Association of Schools. We're very excited to host this webinar because establishing a safe and positive school and district climate is essential for ensuring physical, academic, social, and emotional growth and success for all members of the school community. If you do not have a copy of the Connecticut Model Safe School Climate Policy, you can find it on the CAST website. We're also dropping the link in chat. You may wanna to refer to the policy during our conversation this morning. During this webinar, we will be discussing the critical attributes of a safe and positive school climate and how to create a positive and restorative learning environment in which voices are respected and heard, racial and social justice and equity are supported, social and emotional learning is promoted, and skills of citizenship and democracy are employed. We've assembled a panel of experts on this subject and I will introduce them to you in a couple of minutes. But first I wanna thank our corporate, our corporate partners, Justin's, Horseman, Liberty Bank, the Connecticut Army National Guard and Pullman and Comley for helping to make this web webinar possible. We thank them for their continuing support of CAST professional development for all principals and educators in Connecticut. Again, we're very excited to bring this webinar to you and glad that you're joining us today. As a reminder, the session will be recorded and posted on the CAST website so you can view it later and share it with your colleagues as well as your faculty and staff. Please use the chat feature as a way to stay actively engaged in the learning during the session and let us know if you have any technical issues as we will be monitoring the chat. In addition, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions as we will also be monitoring the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer your questions during this session. It's now my pleasure to introduce our panel of experts for this webinar, and they are, first of all, Dr. Joanne Freiberg, who is a lifelong educator and consultant focusing on a wide arena of improving school climate, restorative practices, bullying, and character education. Dr. Freiberg has worked both as a classroom teacher and as a teacher educator, she currently serves on the Connecticut Social and Emotional Learning and School Climate SEL Collaborative and serves on the Connecticut Statewide Task Force on Sportsmanship. Joanne is a co-founder of School Climate Consultants, LLC. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you. Next, we have Patricia Saccone, who is also a co-founding partner of the School Climate Consultants, LLC. School Climate Consultants LLC is dedicated to assisting schools, districts, and community-based organizations in creating safe and productive learning environments. She also serves on the Connecticut Social and Emotional Learning and School Climate SEL Collaborative, had as a retired Connecticut superintendent most recently from Westbrook, and is currently serving as the interim superintendent of Lebanon Public Schools. Welcome, Pat. Thank you, Rosie. Next, we have Patrice McCarthy, who is the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education CABE Deputy Director and General Counsel. She represents CABE by serving on many different councils, collaboratives, committees, and task forces representing CABE, including the Connecticut Social and Emotional Learning and School Climate SEL Collaborative. Welcome, Patrice. Good morning, everyone. We also have Dr. Janet Robinson joining us today. She has served as a superintendent of Stratford Public Schools since 2013. She's also served as superintendent of the Newtown Public Schools and earned her doctorate in educational leadership from the University of Connecticut. She also serves on the Connecticut Social and Emotional Learning and School Climate SEL Collaborative. Welcome, Janet. Thank you and good morning to everyone. We have Steve Hernandez Esquire joining us today. He is the Executive Director for the Commission on Women, Children, and Seniors. Mr. Hernandez previously served the Connecticut State Legislature as Director of Public Policy and Research for the Connecticut Commission on Children. Prior to joining the Commission, Mr. Hernandez served seven years as a Legislative and Budget Director in Washington, D.C. for Council Member Jim Graham. He's one of the three co-chairs of the Connecticut Social and Emotional Learning SEL Collaborative. Welcome, Steve. And Steve is muted, Good to but see everyone. Good to <laughs> there see you. you go. Great, thank you, Steve. And we also have Sahana Smith, who is the principal of Reed School, a pre-K through eight school in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Prior to working in Bridgeport, Sahana was an assistant principal at Hamden School High School and at Thomas Edison Magnet Middle School in Meriden. Sahana is trained under Mark Brackett at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, and she is a licensed trainer of restorative practices through the International Institute of Restorative Practices. Welcome, Sahana. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me and good morning, everyone. Great. So it's wonderful to have all of you here with us today. So let's get started. And to begin, I'm going to ask Joanne, um, we'll start with you, to help frame the conversation and give us the background and the context about what's happened in the last couple of decades and how we've gotten to where we are. So let's begin by having all of us um, go back and take a moment in history, a day that I think we'll never forget, April 20th, 1999, Columbine. Although there have been school shootings previous to Columbine, the Columbine shooting was at the time the worst high school shooting in US history and prompted a national debate on gun control and school safety, as well as a major inve investigation to determine what motivated the gunmen, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. This was a critical turning point in American education. From your perspective, how is education in general and specifically district and school policies, cultures and climates changed since Columbine? Thank you for asking that question because I really think it's an important way to, to frame where we've gone in the last decade. Um, that was April 20th, 1999. And I agree with you that it was the most horrific school shooting, but I think what's also important and it's important in a, in a contextual way today is that it was the first rampage school shooting to happen in an upper middle class suburban community. Prior to that, it was in the South in rural areas on native lands, but um, it just pointed out that the, the nation will stand up and pay attention when, we, when it hits us in our upper middle class suburban communities. But that aside, um, prior to Columbine, there were no anti-bullying laws. And that's very important because as a nation, ideologically, we're fairly reactive. We're not very good at getting thing, things right in the beginning. And so the very first state, one of the things that was raised after Columbine was we, we have to look at issues like bullying. So guess what we did? And the first state to pass an anti-bullying law was Georgia about two to three months after Columbine. And then rapidly every state followed suit. And it wasn't until September of 2015 that the 50th state passed its anti-bullying law. That was Montana. Now, all states have an anti-bullying law, and I can say that Connecticut is, is illustrative of every one of them. Passing an anti-bullying law and saying get rid of bullying is kind of like playing whack-a-mole. Um, 50 states, 50 different definitions. It keeps changing. We keep trying to, to manage this, this beast. We think it's an epidemic. Um, when in reality, the ultimate remedy for stemming this tide of bullying is really to create positive environments that don't support these kind of behaviors. So um, my fondest hope, and I'll put this out here now and my wonderful colleagues can speak to this going forward, is that the legislature sees the wisdom in where we are going because although we have the letter of the law, which is get rid of bullying, the spirit of the law is to create safe places for young people. And I think that's what sort of brings us here today because we do have a model policy in this state that speaks to that. And if we were to go down that road, it would change um, exponentially the, the lives of, of leaders like Sarhana, who has to investigate every one of these and upwards of 70% of an instructional leader's time often is taken up investigating bullying complaints and so on. So we have to look at this from the right end and, and stop dealing with it from the wrong end. Rosie, you're muted. <laughs> so I'm just gonna keep mine on because otherwise I'm gonna forget. Um, so Pat, when you were hired at Westbrook as a superintendent and the board knew that a safe and positive school climate was your theory of action for overall school improvement, why was this so important to you? And more importantly, how and why did you develop the safe school climate policy? Well, thank you. Um, so yes, it was very important to me and probably came of years of just looking at the struggles um, that adults working in schools and children have in terms of how we deal with uh, problems, with discipline issues, and how we even deal with what we're noticing and is growing. And that's the kind of, I know so many of us refer to, you know, the baggage that's coming into schools um, with children today. And so that 
became a great commitment of mine, um, even at the state um, technical high schools, um, and began working on remedies for that, which, which obviously I became um, much more concerned about developing those climates. And so um, I approached the board and in fact, probably did a lot of that chatter about it um, during the interview process as well, but waited um, a respectful year or two um, to get the board engaged in this. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. And I think if anything is really important in, in the journey that I took, it's that the board wrote their policy. And often when we do policy work, boards do assemble um, in subgroups and subcommittees, but so often um, the policy work becomes without the, thank God, we have the help of CAVE and um, boards attorneys and all of that to, to look at the language that's going in. But very often it's a wordsmithing kind of process. This truly was from the ground up. We had the state's anti-bullying policy 5131.911. And we literally looked at that and thought, how can we honor what needs to be here, but also imply, if not implicitly, explicitly, because that's what policy language is about, um, that we would seek to work restoratively. What will it take for us to get there knowing that the foundation is developing and enhancing our climate. That's the direction we went in. Um, it was a long process. It was hours and hours and evenings. Um, and we had many people reading the policy before it even went to the board for its full board for its first read. We had attorneys from um, Shimon and Goodwin. That's the law firm that the school district used at the time. We um, also worked with Cabe and Vin Mastero and lots of the consultants there. And we also um, had people from the National School Climate Center who looked at it and critiqued and so on. So it was an effort to really give our teachers um, an opportunity to, to know that there was the strength of policy language behind what was really coming which was we need to address social and emotional growth. And I'm starting to shy away from social and emotional learning because that immediately takes us in the realm of people thinking there's a curriculum and a set of lessons. There are not, what we needed to address was how to help our students grow socially and emotionally as well as academics. So that was really the journey. Great. So Pat, I'm going to stop you there and the, um, because I want to talk to Patrice for a minute. But I do have to say before I turn to Patrice that probably the greatest learning for the school board is when you have to write your or you get to write your policy. Because if you can, we, as we all know, if you can articulate what you've learned, you've learned it. And so um, I think that was probably great. And maybe Patricia can talk about that too, but I think that's probably a great professional development kind of learning activity for a board to go through. But I also wanna ask you, Patrice, um, CABE reviewed the Safe School Climate Policy and codified it and gave it the number 5131.914. Can you explain to us why this policy is important for districts and describe some of the most important principles of the climate policy? Why school boards of education and superintendents embrace should embrace and adopt this policy? Sure, thanks a lot for that question. Um, as in many areas, CABE felt it was important to put a model before boards of education, so they didn't have to start from scratch in order to meet uh, the statutory and other legal requirements. But the process that Pat described is a very important part of that, where the board of education members actually embraced what the intent of the policy was and understood fully what it was attempting to achieve. Um, there are several aspects of the policy that relate to the work of boards of education. One is reviewing data and lo looking at uh, school climate surveys, looking at uh, disciplinary referrals, and as the footnote in, in one section of the policy refers to, using that data as a flashlight 
to identify areas that need improvement, not as a hammer, not as a way to punish people for what has happened in the past, but looking forward as to how the board can better support the school community, both students and staff. One of those supports, again, a role of the board is to make sure that there are resources for professional development for the staff, because we know that a, a staff that embraces not only the philosophy of a policy, but also has the tools so that they can support their students, so they can de-escalate situations that might otherwise um, lead to, to an unwelcoming school climate, and, and that they have a continuum of resources available to them to support their students. That also goes to the issue of resources in terms of supporting social emotional growth and having uh, school social workers, school psychologists. Again, those are very significant investments for schools that boards struggle to make sure that they can provide those resources to their students. We, we know that we don't have enough of those professionals in our buildings. And we know that uh, to a large extent, that is a matter of the resources. Another role for the Board of Education that's reflected in the policy is outreach to the community, making sure that this is not viewed as simply a school issue, but that there needs to be community support and recognizing how important climate is to the academic growth of students, that those two go hand in hand, that they're not separate entities. And then finally, something that CABE, uh, another policy that we developed several years ago that was adopted by our board members in Connecticut and then ultimately adopted by the National School Boards Association. And that has to do with civility, making sure that the adults at all levels of government model civility, that they follow their code of ethics because we know that our students are always watching we know that we have seen an increase recently in race-based threats by both adults and students. Um, and we, it, it's only through the adult leaders at all levels of government, making sure that they are demonstrating the types of behaviors in their actions and in their words that we want our students uh, to demonstrate and that's how we're going to get to a safer school climate, a more welcoming school climate for all of our students. Thanks, Rosie. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that civility policy because I hadn't, I really hadn't heard of that one before. And I think that's so important since adults are the models and kids are looking up to us. Um, that's huge. So I'm gonna look into that one and I hope our listeners and viewers will do that as well. So thank you. What number was that one, Pat, Patrice? I don't have the number off the top of my head. I'll, I'll get it for you before we're done, hopefully. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to you, Pat, because once the policy was adopted by Westbrook, what did you as the superintendent do to implement with fidelity and embed this policy throughout the district and the work that you're doing? Well, it became the core of all of our strategic planning. Um, and I guess in one word, um, training, training, training. Um, it was so important to train our staff and that meant staff at all levels, not just our certified staff, but everyone in the school building, every face. Um, and then um, I think communication to our parents and guardians. And a lot of that we did through our wellness um, committees and, and our wellness work, but um, we brought students in very quickly. And that's the other central key for implementation. We really needed to make sure that our students understood what we were doing as well. They're a central part of this. They represent 75 to 80% of the school population and they really got involved in it. So as far as implementation, we were trying very hard not to be mysterious with any group of stakeholders, but to be very clear and transparent about what our mission was. So after implementing the climate policy, what impact did the work have on your district's accountability plans and target goals and what difference did it make and how do you know? Well, 
I honestly think we're living it right now. This is such a difficult time with COVID and all of that. And there, there, there's just no playbook for what everyone is going through. And our um, teachers, when, when we started to hear more and more about needing to address social and emotional learning, which here and after I will call social and emotional growth, um, that we wanted to impact that outcome I felt that our teachers, I started to see it willingly reflected more in their goals, um, certainly was in my goals. Um, and always it became a, a staple, it became part of our budgeting process, everything, um, that we now had license to really address that, um, to take the time to form relationships and do all the things we were getting trained to do. And I think the other single biggest benefit is to see the impact that it had on students, because we are a long, long way from saying students need to have a voice in what they're involved in. Students need more than a voice. They need a role to play. They need something and a way to contribute on a day-to-day -day basis as well. And this is, is the direction we went by doing student trainings as well. If we needed to involve the community, we connected the students to the community. Mm -hmm. I think those were the two biggest benefits. Excellent. I, and I, I, I commend you for involving the students and for involving your whole com community. That's great and giving them a voice. But I also appreciate giving them a role. So um, thank you for that little tidbit there. And I'm going to turn to Janet because you've also worked with your school board as a superintendent to adopt and implement the safe school climate policy. What was it that made you want to adopt the policy and then describe the process that you went through with your district to adopt it along with the steps you took to fully implement and embed it throughout the district? Thank you for the question, Rosie. You know, I, I um, appreciate the fact that it was a mandated, became a mandated policy. It made everybody come to the table. It's a terrible thing to say, well, we're only doing it because it's mandated, but what it did it is it really triggered the action and, and triggered the conversations and brought, brought everyone together for the, at, at the table. So we did much of what Pat has outlined, um, but I think one of the critical things about the policy is it then led into some strategic planning to implement that policy. We didn't want the policy to be on the shelf in, in just strictly compliance. We wanted to live and breathe it because it was good. It was, it, it was doing the right things. We, weren't, we didn't wanna just react when a student um, needed us to talk about bullying. We wanted to do the things that were prevention oriented. And I think, I think we've he heard that from the first three speakers, Joanne and Pat and, and, and uh, Patrice. We started to look at what's the process now. We had, a, we had about a hundred people and community members come together and have these conversations uh, in some community forums and also planning. And we developed action teams that began to work on what are the things that we're doing right now that prevent uh, this, this social emotional growth. And I mean, policies actually do prevent exclusionary disciplinary policies, things of that nature that, that are getting in the way. I don't care how great our bullying policy is. If we're still doing the old practices, we're doing things that get in the way. We looked at our data, it was not looking wonderful. Um, we did some, some surveys of school climate and identify particular areas. And we really concentrated on process. And we recognized, and I heard Pat say professional development, lots of professional de development. Man, that's the truth. We started with the adults. We figured that we can't, we can't do a lot to grow students socially and emotionally if the adults are not able to really give their best and thoughtful uh, actions. And so what we did is we had to do a lot of professional development. They, you can't expect people to simply stop doing the practices they have without giving them some alternatives. So we did a lot of training as Joanne will val validate. She was in our district a lot. And otherwise we were sending people to wherever she was doing training in other places, but we had all of our staff trained and then retrained um, so that they had reviews um, in, in that in restorative practices. 
And we began to show them how the restorative practices were to be used. And we actually put that in as a requirement that began to, you know, before you do anything, you have to demonstrate that you've done some restorative practices with these students. Two kids fighting doesn't just get them kicked out of school. Um, that gets them to the table using this restorative practices and seeing what we can do to help these kids learn how to have problem solving when there is conflict. Um, so those were the kinds of things we, we had to do. So we first concentrated on the adults. Then we began at every school developing those kinds of things that um, help students have responsibility, feel like they have uh, some say in how the school operates. Student voice is very, very important, but it's important in every aspect. Listen to the, to the students. What is it about this school that they feel they, if they had the power, what would they do that, to change it? And then giving them the opportunity to talk about those kinds of things. We, we have consistently worked on Every, as many aspects of the social emotional growth as we can, but we keep remembering that it is how the adults interact and are comfortable about giving voice to their students that is gonna make the difference. So um, we have uh, some social emotional growth types of things in, in place, um, responsive classroom at the elementary and middle schools. And I'll tell you, um, we had, a, I'll give you one instance of, of the impact. We had a middle school that everything evident from our surveys and uh, teachers actually came to me asking for help, had a toxic environment. And with a very, very intentional look at what we were doing um, and, and leadership that really fostered the kinds of things that that school needed within two years, CAS nominated, uh, awarded that school, the uh, school climate um, school in the state. A great a turnaround within two years just by using the practices that were uh, in the social emotional growth field. And what a difference. We do monitor, we look at data, we look at our discipline data. We do look at the survey data that we get from parents and students every year. Um, and then we have some discussions. What are the areas that it looks like we have overlooked or students are feeling uncomfortable in? So um, there's a lot here. We could go on and on and talk, but I know the others have something to say too. <laughs> Very um, valuable. Well, congratulations to the middle school that was able to turn around. And I, I'm, um, I guess I would suggest to anyone listening that if they want to work on their school climate, and especially if you're a middle school, contact Janet and, find, and the school and find out exactly what they did in order to turn it around, because that's awesome. Um, at the um, beginning, when I introduced Sahana, um, she, I mentioned that she trained with Mark Brackett at Yale and that she is also a licensed restorative um, practices trainer. So Sahana, as a principal at Reed School in Bridgeport, describe the demographics of your school and what you as a principal, because now we're going to move down to the school level, what you've done and what you're doing in your school and your district to create a safe and positive school climate. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, we are a pre-K through 8 school. We are a neighborhood school. Um, just between last year and currently as of right now, our population has fluctuated between 700 and 800 students. We're 100% free breakfast, free lunch, free healthy snack, and free dinner for those who um, wish to take it home. Um, our student, about 40% of our students identify as black, about 50% identify as Latino, and about 10% other. Um, so yes, I did train with Mark Brackett um, the year prior coming to, to Bridgeport. And then Fran Rabinowitz was the superintendent when, uh, my first year in Bridgeport. And she brought ruler and she really believed in it. And I felt just really happy to be a part of it because I did have some background in it. Um, for that first year, the focus was on principals and administrators learning the, the, the principles of ruler of social and emotional learning. Um, the following year, I created a school-based team and our focus was to train staff in how to recognize and label their emotions. Um, our initial focus was really primarily on helping them learn the principles so that they can then teach it to their students. 
Um, we then spent time training staff over the following year um, so that they could really, you know, implement it with their, with their students in the classroom. We also started offering workshops to families, um, ongoing communication with parents. We worked with our PAC, our Parent Advisory Council. Um, for summer reading, we would distribute books that support SEL. Um, our classrooms had books that support SEL. And then we were lucky enough, 2017-18, um, to be trained um, under Joanne in restorative practices. And that just really enveloped, that was just, um, that helped us actually renamed our ruler team and to an SEL team because we tried to merge the principles of ruler and restorative practices. Um, I had several teams that were trained under Joanne, and then we even had some middle school ambassadors about uh, two years ago that were trained with Joanne um, in Bridgeport. And um, currently we're using, you know, we're really having a focus right now on using literature to teach the filling word vocabulary, which is necessary for this ongoing recognizing and labeling of emotions. Um, I have, I, I actually really believe that um, teaching and supporting and promoting SEL or um, as Pat termed it, uh, at, uh, social and emotional growth, which I love that term. I believe that it's an ongoing process. You're never done with it. Um, I discovered that in our, like in these, this period of, of about six years that I described, um, we really needed to have this school-wide approach so that all of my staff felt comfortable. We were administering surveys, our district was administering surveys to see how teachers felt about implementing these principles in their classroom. And it, the first few years, the teachers really didn't feel that they that they, they, they still express like some, some fear with, with fearing that they weren't doing it right. Um, and so I decided that a couple of years ago that I needed to model this daily with the staff, kind of like that gradual release of responsibility. I do, we do, you do. And this greatly affected our school climate. Our students started to adopt language immediately. So we modeled and our students followed. I modeled kind of in the morning with morning announcements. I modeled during faculty meetings and it just really ballooned um and like i said our students it was it was almost immediate it was shocking um the way that our students started to adopt language um and of course when you start to adopt the language then your behavior mirrors your language um i do believe that as a leader you have to not only understand social and emotional learning and growth um, and how it impacts you as an individual, how it impacts your students, how it impacts the adults that you work with, your, your families, but you have to embrace it, you have to represent it, and you have to live by it. So this is not a thing. You know, social and emotional learning and growth, it's not a thing. It is basically how you live and how you lead. And that's kind of what I think Janet was getting at too when she was talking about taking it off your shelf and using it and living it um, when you're working with it. So, so great. And I also um, greatly appreciating, I appreciated hearing you talk about modeling and because the more that the kids see how we interact and how we work, the more they're going to copy what we're doing. So um, thank you for mentioning that, Sahana. Um, I'd also like to ask you, um, because like Bridgeport, many of the Connecticut principals are not in districts that have formally adopted the Safe School Climate Policy 5131.914 as it's written. Um, from your experiences, Sahana, how can principals use the Model School Climate Policy, which again um, is listed on the CAS website and we've dropped the link into chat and Karen can drop that again, hopefully for people to guide their work and improve your own school climate and what principles and practices should school leaders pay the most attention to if they wanna start looking at the policy and integrating some of those principles. So um, I, I, I believe that the safe school climate policy is really an outline, it's a map and it relies on increasing our accountability measures. Um, perhaps the, it, the accountability, the increasing the accountability will look different for some. Um, but, you know, a positive school climate is the foundation for learning. It is the absolute foundation for learning. Um, there are some 
essential, really key elements that are that are written right there in the policy. I'm very excited to go through this with my staff and to show them that there are some things that we are doing at the school level. I believe that there are lots of things that we're doing at the district level, but I think that adopting this um, this as a policy um, would really speak volumes. Um, and, and it would impact all of our schools. And I, I can say all of our schools in our district and all of our schools in the state. Um, but some of the you know, real basics that are, that are just so true that are written in this plan, we're talking treating others with dignity, placing an importance on feeling physically, intellectually, socially, and emotionally safe, working collaboratively, and a school community that, community that cares for the physical environment. Um, I, I really like that there is an emphasis in the policy on mean-spirited behavior rather than on that term bullying, um, which is, you know, when I did my training with Joanne a few years ago, I connected with her instantly because she started talking about, you know, this, these, these punitive measures and, and just this term bullying and, and people just really misuse the term and they don't quite understand the term and, and mean spirited behavior really gets at the root of what we're talking about. Um, and, you know, I just, if we're looking there, if you're, if you are a principal or a school district leader, and even if you just start with the effective school climate improvement process, just looking at the essential processes, which some of these I mentioned, collaborative democratic decision making, planning that relies on quantitative and qualitative data collection, identifying school improvement goals, creating a professional learning map for your staff, um, taking a look at your instruction and your student supports, and then examining your policies and procedures. I mean, these were like just the basics that I took out of the plan that I said, um, I'm going to actually really work with my staff to go through this policy, um, but I think that it is something that definitely all schools in Connecticut need to adopt. Great. Thank you for taking us through that. That was very comprehensive. So um, thank you for that. I'm going to turn now to Stephen as the, um, because you are the tri-chair for the Connecticut Social Emotional Learning Collaborative. And one of the charges for the group was to look at um, policies around climate and bullying. Can you describe for us and how this group was formed, the demographics of the collaborative, and the work that the Social Emotional Learning Collaborative has done and is currently working on? Well, thank you for, firstly, thank you for having us. You know, it's just by being on this panel, you can see how far we've come from the conversation that we started in the very beginning, which is this work begins in tragedy because tragedy is, inspires us to do something. The beauty of this work is that it develops the way we develop. And over the years, we've seen it develop and deepen in our understanding. And I love the fact that we're using the term social and emotional growth because it really does capture that moment of us understanding that this is not a skill set like one plus one is two. It's what Sarhana described, which is the way we live. And that is developmental, it is lifelong learning, lifelong development, and, and it is rooted in empathy and connection, which is why it is so incredibly beautiful, but also incredibly important. You know, when we think about the collaborative, this board here really does the case for, for a collaborative of this type, a table where multiple disciplines that involve the day of teaching and learning and beyond can come together, talk, uh, share ideas, share definitions, shared principles, really understand each other, each of our roles in, in supporting social and emotional growth. That's critically important because this work is fundamentally and can fundamentally siloed. And it's siloed because each one of us in our disciplines comes at this work from another perspective. If you're the state legislator who had a suicide in your district, you come at this from the perspective of a person who just wants to make a difference and respond to calamity. If you're a parent, you come at this from the perspective of wanting your child to feel safe and supported while, while you do your best to uh, ensure that your child has an education. If you're a school leader, you wanna be the best school leader to, to, to really be able to bring your resources around, um, around 
this developmental work. And you know what's really exciting is that when I first entered this work, the, the first word that came into my vernacular around this work was the word bullying. But it wasn't until I heard Joanne Freiberg talk about bullying that I was inspired to see this work contextually and in a way that, uh, that I never had before as an attorney work, looking at the laws of the state of Connecticut. And so when you look at a model school, I know we're going to talk more about the model school climate policy, but when you look at the model school climate policy rooted in the principles that I just described, it is no wonder to me that the last year and everything that we have gone through, if you look to the policy, there is a methodology there, there is a roadmap there to address so many of the things that we've that we've experienced in this last year, whether it be despair, whether it be feelings of safety because of the social justice uh, imperative that we're facing in the state and in this country. It's all there. And that's why I prefer the policy because it's not just a call to react, but it's a call to act strategically, the way Janet described, strategically as a district that adopts a policy that is all encompassing in the way that this one is. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're here. And, um, you know, involving all the stakeholders, I, I'm hearing that from most of you guys as we're talking. And that, that's so important, I think, to hear from everyone and to really get them so they understand what it's all about, but also have input and a voice in the creation of the policy and the implementation. And I wanna ask you um, further on the SEL Collaborative, um, where the school climate policy 51319.914 fits into the work that you are doing. Um, what's the discussion been so far? Um, have you adopted the policy? Are you planning to do it? Or um, what are your next steps? And if you are, or if you already have adopted the policy, um, how do you see it fitting in for communicating, influencing, supporting, and advocating for the work that we should be doing in Connecticut? Well, thank you for that. A couple of things. One, we had robust conversations about the model school climate policy as part of our um, early discussions in the collaborative. You know, what's interesting about our laws is that sometimes they instruct, sometimes they teach, and sometimes they try to do both. And what our law uh, in the creation of the collaborative, it, we were asked to adopt the model school climate policy for the state of Connecticut. In a lot of ways, many people around this table and maybe some of our viewers will recognize that that doesn't make any sense. Because what really makes sense is for districts to adopt these poli this, po this model policy. And that makes sense because what happens when a district adopts a policy is that it begins a process of strategic engagement and making the policy your own. And that is so critically important. One of the things that became so clear in the conversation about the model school climate policy is that even in our discussions, we were seeking to make the policy our own, whether we were uh, coming at this from the perspective of, of a teacher's union, coming at this from a perspective of a school leader. And that process of making the policy your own is the process of embedding that policy. So I was really excited to have that conversation with our members around the table, because what it showed us was that the importance of the, the role of the collaborative is to promote the policy, is to promote adoption of the policy, and then to resource as much as we can around adoption of that policy. We are to be a resource. So to your question about whether or not we adopted it, I don't think we need to. I don't think that's the role of this collaborative. The role of this collaborative is to support districts in their adoption of the policy. Now, why is this exciting to us? You know, when you think about, again, the last a uh, couple of years, welcome, support it, and feel safe. The standards in the policy promote social and civic responsibilities and a commitment to social justice. It's also as if the document were passion because the skill set, the developmental skill set, includes all of these important notions that help um, that help really improve the conditions of teaching and learning. Can I just jump in because what Steve was referencing right here is at the core, at the very center of this policy are the national school climate standards. And not everybody knows that there are national school climate standards that were sort of um, finally adopted in 2010. And standard four is the spirit of the anti-bullying law, which is to create welcoming and safe places for everybody. So um, I think, and, and when Pat started 
in Westbrook, if my memory is right, the, um, the board initially uh, endorsed or adopted the standards and then said, it says we should have a policy. <laughs> and that's kind of how that got, got uh, if, if, am I correct, Pat? Is that how that happened? You're, you're muted. Yes, that is absolutely correct. And it was um, kind of, well, it was easier for the board to look at five simple standards and see the value and benefit of them. So adopting those was their first step. Yes, absolutely. I'll tell you, Rosie, one of the, I have to say, one of the things that was so inspirational in our initial work at the commission, when I was at the Commission on Children, we sought to you know, do a kind of a landscape analysis of the state. How can we help was sort of that first idea that you get as a policy person. And what was remarkable is that where we found the principles of social and emotional growth really taking hold in a district is where adults were leading in the space. Adults understood what the principles were and how they could be supportive. But what was remarkable is that young people led as well. And I was never more inspired than when I met uh, uh, Superintendent Ciccone uh, down in Westbrook. And I saw that theory of action in action, young people leading, young people mentoring, and adults really understanding that they were the center of gravity for making sure all of this was possible. And that's what you stand to gain when you adopt these notions. First of all, these standards that are so universal, but also this implementation science that is embodied in the, in the policy. Thank you for mentioning the standards. And I don't know if one of you want to drop the link into the chat. So if people are interested in looking those up, they can find the standards. I think that might be helpful for our viewers and we can link them when we, re when we post this recording, we can link those as well because it is the foundation that people need in order to align it with the policy. So thank you for mentioning that. So um, this, this is a great segue into, now that we've heard from each of you, um, having um, just some questions and I'm gonna open it up to anyone who would like to respond. And just so that you know, this first question is going, I wanna develop the context for it. So it's gonna take a minute to get there, but um, anyone can then jump in. So here we go. There's no question that anti-bullying and positive and safe school climates are very important, but there appears to be a dichotomy between the bullying policy and legislation, and that is being punitive, zero tolerance, strong discipline, and the safe school climate policy, which emphasizes social emotional learning, positive recognition, building community and relationships and using restorative practices to resolve conflicts and create a safe restorative environment. As an educator, a student or a parent, this can be confusing and contradictory, yet we know that ultimately the remedy for bullying is to have a safe and positive school climate. Is there any work at the state level with the SEL collaborative at the legislature with advocacy groups, associations, that's being done to try to resolve this dichotomy. How do these two policies impact each other? Is there a way they can work harmoniously or in tandem? What do you all think? And I'm just opening it up to whoever would like to take talk, talk about that. I thought maybe Steve was gonna jump into this. I'll tell, I will, <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you, so, Part of, part of our secret mission, that's not so secret, of the collaborative is to just that. So one of the things that we found about our bullying law, as it's developed over the years, is that it was, in some ways it was visionary, but in many ways it's incomplete. And I say visionary because even from uh, one of its more recent iterations, there was, a, there was the notion embedded that school climate mattered. Um, because, you know, it, it took a lot, I think, to really help us understand that our school, our anti-bullying laws couldn't just be about the due process around a bullying incident. It really had to be about the importance of embedding principles of positive school climate and the developmental aspects, the growth aspects of social and emotional skills. And that that's huge. It's a, it's a tiny little part of the big anti-bullying law that really needs to be right-sized. And I say that because we have learned so much in just even the last few years of working collaboratively 
about how we really need to raise up these elements of restorative practice, raise up elements of, of promoting positive school climate, of understanding the developmental skill sets that are involved in the every day and the every part of the day of, of teaching and learning. So there's, there is some right sizing to be done. Uh, and I think that's the next step for the collaborative is to work together to do that. This is a, this is, there's teaching, there's hearts and minds involved here, but there's also some real technical work to be done with our law. I think additionally, when we start to look at bullying, I mean, there's not a legislator, a human being for that matter, who doesn't, isn't against bullying. So I think it's quite simple to park that and say, given that that's what we're trying to do, how, what's the strategy and what are the policies and the practices that are going to help us get there? Now, so I, I agree wholeheartedly with Steve. That's where we have to go. Bullying is a label. It's a title. It's a conclusion of a, um, an investigation. That's it. It's not a behavior. So I think a, a very strong policy statement that allows everybody to get behind that and then really roll up your sleeves and say, what's going to solve this problem? We could lead the nation. Let me mention one other thing, just as a point of clarification, because, um, and I think Janet can probably speak to that when you talk about the middle school. So many people think that it takes more time to do this work. And Steve mentioned earlier about silos, as if, you know, you do school climate over here, you do academics over there, but it, it actually saves time. And it certainly gets you where you want to be if in two years, by using that as a theory of action, you can turn, turn around a school where they're not only recognized for school climate, but probably their academics went up too. But I do wanna make a very important um, distinction because the word or the, the label of restorative practices is, is thrown around so often we talk about it, but there's really two, two views of what that is. And unfortunately, people who employ what they think is restorative practices only as a way to diminish suspensions or detentions and so on are not successful and restorative practices gets a very bad um, you know, a reputation. Uh, what restorative practices is, and, and it's a, such a confusing and even unfortunate label because I like to say 80% of working restoratively is creating that positive climate. Because if you don't create that climate, if you don't build that positive environment, when there are conflicts or, or altercations and so on, you can't fix anything. So you mm -hmm. have to build it. And so there's a big difference between using it in a narrow sense and using it in the wider sense. And I'll say one more thing and then let my colleagues jump in and Rosie ask more questions. This is so important in terms of how you do what you do. It's not about doing something else. And people come to the table thinking this takes more time. Well, I guess it takes more time if you wanna invest in relationship and community building up front. but the time you save is exponential. And so I would say if you haven't jumped on the, um, the restorative practices bandwagon, be very careful that you don't get stuck in that narrow sense, just trying to replace the zero tolerance stuff without focusing on the climate and the community and the school. All right. A question just came in and it's how does sexual harassment Title IX fit into the broader discussion? That might fit in right here. Um, Rosie, I, I would like to say something about that because we did have an experience once the state mandated that all schools would address sexual assault, abuse, and neglect pre-K through grade 12 every year, every grade level. And just the educator eye rolling alone uh, when that happened was, was legendary. And so the state responded and a task force was initiated. Um, I had an opportunity to serve on that task force and then ultimately take that to the school district. And it's a very good example, illustrative of what early work and creating a climate where relationship building and trust and support are the watchwords that we had very little difficulty bringing our teachers, our parents, we had focus groups with parents to say, you know, this obviously is designed to inspire as much reporting as possible because we know children aren't living in safe places, but we had buy-in. 
because of the climate work that we were doing. So I'm sure the person asking the question here is relative to huge indiscretions around sexual harassment and Title IX, working on positive climate um, development never takes the place of anything that is adjudicated by law, but it gives us a conversation place, a place to start and a place to make improvements if we find that kind of thing is happening. So sexual harassment, and Title IX violations have to be reported. People will report more freely and more comfortably because they feel supported and they're in an environment where they are contributors. I agree with Pat so much. Um, I think that the, the climate set in a, a district in a school um, allows a person who has feeling victimized come forward rather than just carrying this feeling like, well, I'm not gonna tell anyone because nothing's going to happen or I'm not gonna tell anyone because I'm afraid of retribution. I think the whole, the climate affects all these aspects and you can't deal with the problem unless the victimized person feels safe coming forward and bringing it to a trusted adult to begin the process of, of finding a solution. So I think Pat said it very eloquently. Um, and along with that, um, during this last year, issues of social and racial justice, poverty and equity have also been um, exasperated and more pronounced due to the COVID pandemic. That isn't to say that they weren't with us before, but they are more conspicuous. How does having a safe school climate policy in place help formulate district and school decisions such as budget and curricula, et cetera, and drive the daily work school leaders do within school communities? And along with uh, my question, we have a question that fits in here, which is how does race impact school climate and how can racial equity be embedded in these efforts? You know, I'll tell you one, thank you for that question. What's, what's really compelling about whether it's targeting um, young people because of their race, because of their sexual orientation, whether it's tensions because of, because of a particular designation, whether it's uh, embedded systems that have held people back in school districts or communities, all of these things are symptoms of this Lack of lack of this important developmental skill set, and really supporting empathy and connection in our schools and this developmental growth is part of the strategy of addressing these these issues. Whether they be complex social issues, whether they be complex individual issues uh, that an in, that a person may be facing on any in any moment, you know, part of coming to the table restoratively is understanding not only the skill set of restoration, but having the, the will to do so. Um, so my response is this work aligns very closely to the work of social justice. In fact, it's part of the, one of the principles because it's so important for us to understand that rooted in social justice is empathy, connection, communication, and growth. And actually the, the fifth um, standard is all, uh, fifth, a climate standard is the social justice standard. And so by embracing, um, and I, again, I would hope our legislators take a look at the national school climate standards. And, you know, I, I don't know what the appropriate word is, adopt, endorse, embrace, support, whatever, and encourage districts to look carefully at this policy again, because those national school climate standards really is about mission and vision and safety and equity, and it, it's at the core. And once you you are obligated to embrace those standards, I mean, we could talk about the, the you know, we, schools and districts are, are standards-based. Everything, you have to meet standards, whether it's curricular standards or safety standards or whatever it is. Um, and so I think we have to look at this whole arena as, as Sarhana said before, this is the floor. 
this is sort of, you know, you, you it's the non-negotiable. That's where you have to start. There isn't a principal I've ever met out there that uh, when I make this statement, they, they disagree with me. If you close your eyes and you think about all the, the teachers and the, the educators in the building, certified and non-certified, who do a phenomenal job of relationship building and community building, and, and you then you say, who's getting the best academics? It's always a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if, if we know that's true, why aren't we using climate restorative work, remember climate is 80% of it, as the theory of action for overall school and district improvement. Um, and that's where I hope we go. We, we can just say, let's park the bullying policy. Yes, we're all against that, but what should we be doing as a theory of action to achieve, a lo lower um, the achievement gap? I mean, if anything can do that because it, restorative work is about the process. It's not about individuals making decisions about who did something right and who did something wrong. And I'll give you, you know, you'll get a first uh, warning here, but you won't. It puts the process front and center, which takes out of it so much of the bias. So this is all very much connected. So a lot of head shaking, so I didn't know if someone else wanted to um, respond there or not. But um, moving on, we do have another question um, and it kind of goes along with something that we've talked about a little bit already, which is um, what does an effective school climate and continuous improvement process look like? How do you measure the effectiveness of your district and school environments? Um, specifically, what data collecting tools and instruments and what analytics should we be using to collect the data and analyze our effectiveness and how do we hold ourselves and others accountable for achieving a positive school climate? And someone would really like to see examples of surveys or tools um, that you've used to gather information from students and parents that has successfully been used in your schools. I, I would like to start the conversation with that. Um, you do need some data and you can look at the obvious data, uh, not that this is the be all end all, but you can look at your, um, recidivism in terms of students who are, are chronically misbehaving. Um, you, can, you can look at um, your suspension data, things like that, that alert you to things that are not going well. But I think you also have to do some very intentional kinds of conversations. Uh, and we use a panorama survey uh, every year. And then we have the conversation with the administrative team about what are those what are those questions in there telling us about our each principal about his or her school? How do you set some priorities around areas where, for example, one of the questions is my 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 child feels that school meets his needs. All right, if that is an what's the conversation that we have about that? So when you when the leader of a district is talking to the leaders of a school around those things as opposed, as opposed to academic test scores, it really signals what's important. And it causes people, you know, administrators with who always have good intentions, but that causes them to really see this focus and, and to be much more tuned into that. Um, I believe, and Joanna said this several times, but I believe in terms of theory of action, if our schools have a safe climate where students enjoy coming to school, students feel that they're treated fairly and, and it's a safe environment, we do see academics go up because you're not going to do well if you are in an environment that is making you feel very uncomfortable and this, this frees them up. So I. I think the focus um, is use data to look at that and have those ongoing conversations in terms of helping the building leaders focus in, on the things that are really important and also start to make some plans for those areas that, oh, wait a minute, this is telling me something that I didn't see, so let me get to the root of this. So I, I think the data does help a great deal and um, and we want to we want to take a look at that to make sure there's every constant conversations. It's not a one and done. One of the things that Janet's mentioning here, Saran, were you going to say something? Jump in. 
Oh, thank you. I, I just wanted to add, um, in addition to that, that data that Janet um, outlined, I think attendance data is also really important. We spend a lot of time, like weekly, going through our attendance data and trying to understand who are the students who aren't coming to school and trying to get to that root, um, root of, of why and then how do we get them in school or how do we get them online for remote learning. Um, we are also using a survey that's run by Panorama that does an excellent job at helping us really break apart the data and look at it um, in a, through a number of lenses. Um, and it, another two um, common questions that, are, that the students are asked in the fall and the spring, um, one is I feel safe going to at least one adult if I need to. Um, another really good question that we're looking at this year is um, I can use to, something along the lines of I can use tools to help me when I'm angry. And so, the, you know, looking at the way that students respond to these types of questions, and they are categorized into um, sense of belonging, um, sense of self, um, relationship with others, and they really do help us um, get at the root of what do our children, how would our children feel about these things, and what's the work that we need to do to have a higher percentage, to have the children feel more successful in these areas. I was going to say that all the things, and Sarhana just um, punctuated that the things that Janet is mentioning and, and Sarhana are mentioning are about school connectedness. And we know definitively that kids who are highly connected to school do well. And it, it, there's five simple measures. They're easy to, um, to ask. Um, whether you ask it in a little survey or uh, I've recommended at least for our secondary students who all have to fill out student success plans or their counselors or whomever, add those five questions. Do you feel as though you belong? Do you have an adult you can go to? Do you have friends? Do you feel safe? All of those things. And that is, is an easy way to deal with um, every secondary student in, in Connecticut. But I can tell you that um, schools that have really focused on school connectedness and working restoratively have dramatically um, impacted their chronic absenteeism rate. And um, it, it's just phenomenal because if, if school is a joyful place, they show up and guess what? If they show up, they're there for learning. If they're not showing up, it's very hard. So um, everything kind of fits together. It goes back to the quality of relationships. I saw there was a question in here about climate and culture. Um, somebody wanted to know what's the what's the difference. Uh, I've, some people don't make a difference. You know, they use those interchangeably. I tend to make a difference only because I want to know, I want folks to understand that that the root of climate is relationships. So how will the people within the school or the workplace treat one another um, in every way? You know, socially, emotionally, culturally, intellectually, physically, all those kinds of things. And culture is those wider norms and expectations and so on. Um, so th they, they impact each other. If you have a toxic culture, it certainly impacts the relationships. But as Janet mentioned, if you can strategically work on the relationships in school, at least I think this is what you're saying, Janet, that, that you can transform a culture. So um, it, you really do have to focus on the people and how the people interact and how they're modeling and all those kinds of things. And then of course, we now have the wider culture, which um, since, uh, wow, you know, the, the George Floyd um, Black Lives Matter, I mean, we've been doing this for 400 years, but since that brought it back in our, our, our living rooms, this is a, a moral imperative to deal with all of these things and not tomorrow, I mean, yesterday. So we're in the midst of it and it, it, it's all highly connected. I just want to add to the connectedness and then I'll, I'll jump to you, Patrice, is, is also the fact that we're talking about students, but I think teacher retention and attendance on staff is just as important as for students. And I think we need to make sure that we build those relationships as well. And Patrice, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. And we, we know that we have an even uh, larger challenge with the fact that so many of our students have been disengaged during the either fully remote or hybrid learning models that we've needed to do because of the pandemic. So getting them re-engaged in a meaningful way, addressing the attendance issues, again, where we see huge disparities in engagement in various communities, that's going to have to be a, a real focus in the next uh, two years, probably. 
And another one that I've heard principals talk about too is um, looking forward to next year, the students who have been out that may have anxiety coming back into the school because they've been away. So that's another thing I think that we're going to have to turn our attention to as well. I also want to just mention in the chat that we do have from um, Amanda, um, I think it was Amanda, I can't see her name now, but we have several instruments that people have typed in. So if anybody else has any instruments or things that you've used that you think would be helpful, go ahead and put those in. We'll try to capture those and post um, links to those as well um, when we post this webinar later on. So I guess what I'd like to do now, I think we have time for one more question, and that is um, kind of still getting back at this whole idea of climate. Most of us have walked into schools and from the minute you open the door, you can either feel warm and welcomed or cold and uninvited. So just because your district has a safe school and district climate policy, doesn't mean that the schools in your district have positive school climates. For people who are watching, a lot of times we can say, we just feel it when we open the door, but what is it that really makes an exemplary school climate? And what are the look fors if you are a principal trying to make sure that your school is a safe school? and has a positive climate. You know, I, I, I can start. Uh, we're in this pandemic now, uh, all of us, and we've been so separated from one another. And I'll tell you, one of the things that has just warmed my heart um, just in the past few months, because we do have students coming to school for in-person learning, is seeing how excited the students are when they come to school. Like they are running from their parents' car. They are running off of the school bus. They are just really happy to be back in school. And so that says a lot to me as the principal. It, it, it really does warm my heart. I mean, prior to the pandemic, we had visitors in our building all the time. We had partnerships with, you know, students at Sacred Heart University, um, uh, uh, mentors and, and volunteers that came in through the School Volunteer Association. And so I would always get feedback from um, visitors saying, you know, wow, the, the, everyone here is so friendly. The staff, you know, we all speak to each other. We're all, if someone's, if it, just from the adult level, if, if someone's not okay, like the buzz gets around. And if you haven't run into that person, you, you know, the, it'll get to me and I'm gonna go in and check on you and say, hey, is everything okay? I heard you, you seemed a little down this morning. But then from the students, I've had visitors who say, you know, students are, are willingly showing people like here, the bathroom's right down the hall, you know, let me show you, I'll walk and I'll show it to you. So the those are all of, um, those are just some of the basics back like pre-pandemic, but there's nothing like seeing the excitement on middle schoolers' faces, four-year-olds' faces um, when they're coming back to school and they are, they're just happy to be, to be in school. And, and I think that says a lot, that goes to that connectedness, um, that shows you that, that, um, the children feel like they belong and that's what you want. You want the children to feel like this is their school. They belong here. Oh yes, you're so right on Sarhana. And you know, having been uh, involved for a number of years uh, with the Connecticut Center for School Change and we do rounds in a number of different schools around the state. It's so interesting, regardless of what we think we're looking for as we're in there, the thing we always remark on is how the, the the feel of the people within the school really matters. You know, you're walking down the hall and you, you see a, a, an adult who immediately speaks to you, makes eye contact. So, you know, uh, the students feel comfortable, you know, just talking to you. And in many cases, we come in as strangers, they're set up as our guides and they chit chat with us as they do this, <clears throat> tells us a lot about a school so that sense of saying, well, I can feel, I can feel it here is very live and well. I look to see how people speak to one another. They feel comfortable speaking to one another. I look to see student work up. Uh, I look for those kinds of things that says, hey, this is a kid kind of place um, that, you know, the, the, the students are really feeling some pride in their school. They, they feel that the adult, they can speak, speak to you because the adults there treat them with respect. So, you know, they'll speak to you and, and talk to you with confidence. So uh, I think there's a lot of seeing how people interact with one another that really matters. 
I would just add that I'm, I'm seeing this as well on the day to day. It's remarkable how much they want to be in school and how much they miss the interactions. And if we, if we acknowledge always that the reason they're coming to school is not because they're dying to struggle with quadratic equations or decoding, it's to be social and to have fun and to see those trusted adults again. That's how and when you know schools are looking at their growth socially and emotionally and setting the conditions where that can happen. Um, and it's pretty remarkable. So I know, and I, I agree, you know, I, I always, as a principal, love seeing the smiles on the kids' faces walking down the hall or wherever in their classroom learning. So there, I don't think there's anything that says it better than the smiles on the kids' faces. Um, we talked a little bit about professional learning and um, some, and so I want to just ask to see if there's any other suggestions that you might have for professional learning technical supports that should be implemented in order to build the competence and the capacity to ensure that not only the teachers and the students know what's going on, but school boards, administrators, school leaders, support staff, parents, the community members, what suggestions would you have for those other groups of people? Well, I, in terms of school boards, I think they should be receiving periodic reports on the implementation of, of this policy and, and other support systems. Some of that is uh, then reflected in their budget decisions in terms of where they're allocating resources, but they really do need to have this ongoing focus um, on their board agendas. I found over the years, and Patrice, maybe you can speak to this, tell me I'm, I'm wrong, but in being invited to speak to boards about what this work is about, some of it is education. I mean, boards come in because they care deeply about their schools and about academic growth and so on. Um, but I think that they don't necessarily know in an explicit way how important this, um, this landscape that we might call climate and, and by extension working restoratively is. And I find that um, as just reflecting on my 14 years at the State Department, being the lucky person to answer the bullying complaints, um, I did an awful lot of education because parents, rightly so, were unhappy when their child was injured or marginalized or excluded. And they wanted safety and they wanted the behavior to stop. And their toolboxes were such that it was only a hammer, you know, get that kid out of the school, you know, lock them up at the age of six. And I say, well, if you really want those goals, that's not how you, you get there. And so I think for the most part, parents, community members, board members are, are educable. But I think they, adults don't know what they don't know. And it is so important to um, have boards as well as administrative councils and so on, understand what this work really is about. Because again, it's gotten a bad name in too many avenues because um, it, it, we either do this or we do academics. So um, I don't know if anybody else has anything about that, but. I, I would just say, train, train around your strategic process. Don't strategize around your training. Make a decision about what your strategic process is and then fill in those blanks because it's, it's, it's really embracing a strategic process, a strategy that really hones in um, will and it hones you around your resourcing. So uh, that, that would be the only thing that I would add. Thank you. Um, this has been like I could just keep asking questions all day because you guys are so great at, and I'm learning so much just listening to you, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask my final question and I want each one of you to respond to it. So if I gave you a magic wand and you can wave it to make one wish come true, where would you wave it? What would you ask for? What do you expect to see happen? And what would be the long lasting positive change or outcome? Somebody want to go first? Um, I'll start. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to relate mine just to this pandemic. Uh, when our school closed in March, we did not have computers for students. I mean, the computers, the few that we were able to loan out 
were missing keys, the mouse pad was bubbled over, the screen was cracked, and that was literally what we had. And so, you know, co this whole pandemic really did shed a light on the inequities that ex that exist here within the state and as well as across the country. So. I would love for my magic wand to create um, equitable opportunities and realities for my students. Um, we now have, because um, of because of you know what the State Department has done um, with the monies that they've given to districts, all of our students have a device. We're now one to one. But that device now this year, as opposed to last spring, has helped us maintain our relationships. It's helped us maintain our school climate even in a remote setting, and it's allowed our children to continue to have that sense of belonging. It was a very dark time from March 2020 to June 2020 to not be able to remain in contact with children as regularly as, as we needed to. Um, so, so that my magic wand would really um, create equity for my district, for, my, for the students in my school. Great, thank you, Sahana. My magic wand would have to do with, with um, changing minds and, and, and hearts. Um, that all people, um, all adults in a, in, a, in a school see that they are a critical part of the student's success. That it, but sometimes you have to go an extra mile for a student. And that to, if your mindset is I'm content oriented, I am here to teach those quadratic equations that were mentioned earlier. And let the counselors, let the social workers reach out to those students who um, need reaching out to, then we will never be successful. So part of the, part of the, the, the work um, is changing minds and hearts. But with all the work, there, there are still individuals who still don't, don't invest in this in a way that I wish all people would. Um, because it does, and just because you reach out to a student doesn't mean you're immediately successful. Um, I believe that we have, that part of this is remembering that you won't always get the immediate feedback of what you're doing. Um, that the kid immediately turns around because you've done the extra work that, you know, um, kids aren't gonna necessarily say, oh, thank you, Dr. Robinson, I really needed this conversation and I realize you really care and I'm changing my attitude. No, it may take a while for that relationship to, to endure. And I, and I just want every adult to not give up on that. I want every adult to go the extra mile. Um, that's my wish. Great, thank you. I, oh, I guess I, I could... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Pat. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Well, I certainly agree with, with the uh, wishes of the previous speakers. My wish would be that the legislature, rather than enacting very specific, isolated requirements for school districts, would recognize the things that we've been talking about this morning, the need for a strategic and comprehensive approach to supporting our students, and staff and moving away from the, we'll put in a very specific requirement and the district has to check the box that they have provided that professional development or provided that piece of the curriculum. That it really is a, a community um, structure that has to be in place and it has to be embraced by all the members of that community. Maybe we should wish for them to watch this webinar. <laughs> Pat, I'll let you go. So I, I think I'm probably um, in total agreement. I guess if I could wave a magic wand um, and think what would be the most benefit, I would say it's look for the silver linings um, because there's so much that as tragic as even COVID is, there is much that has come out of this. There's much that we're illustrating in, in this webinar that can help to change the hearts and minds that jo um, Janet is talking about. Um, prior to the pandemic, right up until March, as early as last March, we still had staff members 
complaining that they didn't know how to turn on their computer or use that smart board or whatever it was, I can guarantee you we are significantly beyond that now. And if that's the only silver lining, it's a way for us to stay connected if this pandemic continues. So I guess we've got enough real examples that illustrate how we might do this. So if I could wave a magic wand, I first anoint myself as being able to go back 10 years, 12 years and do it all over again with everything I've learned because I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, but beyond that, um, these are the, the examples we could present to the collaborative, to, to the legislators, to help inspire whether it's, as Steve says, and it makes sense, their support versus any type of adoption, but their support um, is really important. Otherwise, um, I'll borrow liberally from my uh, friend, Dr. Freiberg, all we're going to do is continue to admire the problem but we've got real good examples. So let's, let's get those out. So there you go, Rosie. It's a, it's a plea to watch the webinar. <laughs> I agree. Uh, Steve. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, would, I think I would wave my magic wand over the adults and just, and just implore upon all of us to understand that this is lifelong work. And this isn't just something that we're delivering to children. It's not just something that we're bringing into the school building. It's work that really permeates our every part of our day. And it's, it's about growth. And that's why sometimes this feels so tough because it, it really does require us to look inward and how it is that we contribute to the, condi the conditions of team learning, thriving, and building successful relationships. So I would just, I would just ask the adults, it's not just about you leading, but also about being part of that learning and part of that lifelong development. And I guess I get to say something here. I, I agree with all my colleagues and I, I um, so each, each and every one of them has something, I wish we had 10 magic wands, but I guess what I would like to see happen is that for the, the movers and shakers, which means the legislators, um, superintendents, um, community leaders, and so on, to become educated around what this work that we're talking about is and why it's so important to take, as Patrice says, the big, big look at this. Because so often we, we all get our little, oh, I want this to happen or I want that to happen, and we're losing it. And if there's anything that people talk about on the other side of COVID. I hope there is another side of COVID. I don't want to go back. And the forward that we're going to better be what we're talking about now, or, you know, I just worry. I'm usually a very positive person, but I worry that we will have missed an opportunity to look at all the silver linings and to um, really help the adults do that introspection and make the right decisions and, and not get stuck in the little things. So as I'm looking at the chat, um, and this is, I, I said that we had the final question and we did just because we're running out of time, but I think where we go next is probably another webinar that we may wanna do. But the question is that they've got a policy in place but they haven't engaged the learning community fully. So where do they begin that process? And I think that's where we all need to just stop where we are and let's move forward and try to figure that out. So that may be a topic for another webinar moving forward. But I do wanna say that I agree with all of you on waving your wands. And if we were able to have all of your wishes come true, what a wonderful world, what a wonderful state, what wonderful schools we would have all across the country. So maybe this conversation can plant some seeds that begin to grow and we can actualize the changes that you just mentioned. The work that you've all done in this arena is incredible. Some great models for anyone wanting to dig in, get their feet wet and their hands dirty and to work to adopt and implement a safe school policy in their district. On behalf of all of us at CAS, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing your knowledge, your experiences, your expertise. So thank you, Joanne, Pat, Patrice, Steve, Janet, and Sahana for being here today. 
And for the principals and educators viewing this webinar, as Sahana mentioned, you can begin this work without a district policy. In fact, we have mentioned that the model safe school climate policy is posted on the CAS website and will be linked to the recorded version of this webinar. You can use the model policy to guide the work that you're doing in your schools and in your classrooms to improve and create positive and restorative school environments. In addition, please reach out to the experts that you heard on the panel today or to me at CAS so that we can help you on your journey to improve your school climate. Because as we said, this is a beginning and this work is like a whole journey. And we've got a lot of work to do in order to keep improving our schools and our school climate. So again, I wanna thank our corporate partners, Justin's Horace Mann, Liberty Bank, the Connecticut Army National Guard and Pullman and Comley for your help in making this webinar possible. We also wanna thank them for their continuing support of our CAS professional development webinars for all principals and educators in Connecticut. And once again, I'd like to thank our very knowledgeable panel of experts. I would also like to thank all of you for joining us today. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted for future viewing on the CAS website. Please share the link with your colleagues once it's posted. And again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Stay safe, stay well, and take care and enjoy the snow.